This program is part of Inside Opioid Addiction, Examining the Epidemic, an ongoing KET initiative. Good evening, and welcome to Disrupting the Opioid Epidemic, a KET Forum, our second program on this topic. We'd like to set the stage for our discussion tonight with a brief look back at the public health crisis and the evolving national, state, and local responses. For years, KET has brought together voices on the front lines of battling addiction and provided in-depth discussions on policies that seek to make a difference and save lives. With all the work that's been done, there is still much to do. Overdose rates have continued to climb since 2012, reaching a peak last year by taking over 1,500 lives. Some projections show half a million Americans could lose their lives to opioids in the next decade if changes aren't made. Families, communities, and citizens across our country are currently dealing with the worst drug crisis in American history. The issue has raised alarms at the highest levels of government. Congress has moved on legislation to combat the epidemic. CARA and the Cures Act will provide over a billion dollars nationwide for solutions. By increasing prevention, treatment, recovery, and law enforcement tools, CARA can help prevent more people from struggling with addiction to begin with, and it can help foster long-term healing for those already struggling with addiction. The federal laws streamline the process to get new treatments to market, provide funding for improving drug monitoring programs and making treatment more accessible to those in need. In many ways, Kentucky is a national pace setter in fighting addiction. Finding answers is at the forefront of leaders' minds. The opiate addiction is, is real. It's systemic throughout this state and beyond. It is a scourge that we have got to fight with everything in us. In 2012, the Kentucky General Assembly passed House Bill 1, setting standards for dispensing prescription drugs and requiring reporting with the state drug monitoring system called CASPER. The system was the first online drug monitoring program in the nation and has helped to bring opioid prescribing rates down in the state. We run the pill mills out by enacting tough, strong legislation and we ensure that they don't come back. Senate Bill 192 from the 2015 Kentucky General Assembly and the creation of Operation Synthetic Opioid Surge by United States Attorney General Jeff Sessions have increased law enforcement efforts to tackle drug distributors. We're preventing addiction from spreading. We are saving lives by remo removing drug dealers from our community. That's what is, is at stake in our work. That is why we are attacking the gangs and the cartels. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The Legislative can. remedies are only part of the solution. A recent Kentucky Health Issues poll by the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky found that 7 in 10 Kentuckians view addiction as a disease, and everyday citizens are working to save lives and find solutions. Every student in Kentucky is classified at risk for being exposed to, uh, to the substance abuse problem. We want to develop leadership. We want to give them uh, the tools that they need for refusal. When we begin to simply judge others... If God has put me in this ministry for almost 20 years to save one soul, it was worth it. Communities are taking action too. Coalitions are working to raise awareness and serve where the government doesn't. According to state health officials, syringe exchange programs have opened in 43 Kentucky counties, and naloxone is available for first responders to reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. Drug courts and jails are working to manage the unique circumstances presented to those living with a substance use disorder. Treatment programs across the state are trying to help people get clean and live a drug-free life. KET has followed these people and told their stories as Kentucky looks for solutions to one of its most devastating problems. There is no one road to recovery. We need all the tools at our disposal that we can have, and we need to tailor people's treatment to the individual, what is most likely to work for them. Joining us to talk about disrupting this epidemic are Russell Coleman, United States Attorney in the Western District of Kentucky, Dr. Alan Brinzel, Medical Director for the Kentucky Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities, 
Jennifer Hancock, President and CEO of Volunteers of America Mid-States, and Van Ingram, Executive Director of the Kentucky Office of Drug Control Policy. We also have a great studio audience filled with individuals and groups dedicated to addressing this issue, and we're so pleased to have each and every one of them here. And we'll be hearing from some of them a little later on throughout this program. We have encouraging news to share tonight about innovative and disruptive programs. However, we have to start with the overdose numbers, which are alarming. In the just released numbers, the total number of overdose deaths in 2017 was 1,565. That's up from 1,468 in 2016. Fentanyl was involved in 52% of the deaths. Heroin was involved in 22%, down from 34% the year before. However, there was a significant increase in meth-involved overdoses from the previous year. And so to start us off, Mr. Van Ingram, whose office actually compiled this report, we're going to have you contextualize these numbers for us. What do they mean? Where are we seeing spikes or even decrease when it comes to this epidemic? Well, Kentucky, like much of the nation, is just devastated with illicit fentanyl. Um, it it is in embedded in the drug supply, um, largely because we've had some success with reducing the amount of prescription opioids that, are, that, are, that used to glut the marketplace. Um, uh, the pill mills that were so proliferated with, with prescription drugs uh, are gone for the most part. Um, and, and so fentanyl and heroin has taken its place. Fentanyl is so dangerous, it, it can be made to look like heroin, it can be made to look like a prescription pill, and we see that often. Um, so we're concerned about the rise of methamphetamine as well. Methamphetamine is a dangerous drug in, in its own right, not often leading to overdose deaths, but causes a myriad of other problems. Um, Alprazolam stays about the same, Xanax, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's involved in, in, in a large percentage of our deaths as well. So uh, these are heartbreaking numbers. I mean, they just, they just are. Some um, of the demographics, people ages 35 to 44 were the largest demographic in overdose deaths. This middle age group here is being pretty hard hit. Th absolutely. This is, you know, it's, 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 it's always tragic when a young person dies, but behind these numbers we see the 45-year-old truck driver with lower back pain has been treated for 15 years. And, and now can't get opioids that way and is seeking them on the street. Jefferson County had the highest amount of overdose deaths uh, in, the, in the state. And of course, uh, Fayette County, Kenton County, still, those are the ones the most ravaged by this. Not much budge in those numbers. Not much, but you look at the per capita numbers and we see Boyd County and Mason County coming into the two counties we haven't seen in, in, in that top five before. Uh, just showing this, this problem is, is devastating all of our sta communities. Yeah, Dr. Brenzel, you are primarily concerned with treatment and prevention. So when you hear these numbers, what do you make of them? I think what it tells me is this problem is complicated. So we have been engaged in a lot of strategies to reduce it, but the needle keeps moving. And it really shows that fentanyl has been the game changer. The lethality of fentanyl, the availability of fentanyl, uh, has really uh, sort of thwarted our efforts to decrease that overall number. I, I am encouraged that the overall uh, e ER visits for overdose, it looks like we're having a few quarters of decrease. And so I am optimistic, but, but fentanyl really has rocked our state and, and is responsible for this increase. Russell, you've dealt with this issue quite a bit, and to say that uh, opioids are the main crux of, of the epidemic of addiction kind of misses the mark in some ways. We heard Mr. Ingram talk about meth. So tell us about what you're seeing across the state, and particularly Western Kentucky. It's critically important that we're talking about opiates, the, the nomenclature that, that brings us together tonight, critically important. But by the same token, in the western part of the state, Oldham County West in the Western District, our most significant drug threat, other than in Jefferson County, is methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, and these, these are not, this is not the cook at home method that we saw for years, causing environmental issues and filling University of Louisville's burn center with burns, burn victims. This is cartel produced methamphetamine from across the border in Mexico. You don't have to be an economics professor to, to see the distinctions here. You're bringing in a higher quality, higher purity methamphetamine, large quantities, thus bringing the price down, and it is, it is the next phase in our drug epidemic in this Commonwealth. Ms. Hancock, I want to bring you in pretty quickly here. Your organization provides treatment and recovery services to a vast variety of people. From your perspective and the people you serve, how do these numbers strike you? In the face of these staggering numbers, what we see is hope for comprehensive solutions that Volunteers of America has been providing for decades. Everything from housing solutions to mm -hmm. syringe exchange programming to 
infectious disease outreach to get people tested for hepatitis C and HIV, and absolutely expanding our treatment access and availability throughout Kentucky. We're so proud of the fact that soon we'll be opening a Freedom House program in southeastern Kentucky. It is desperately needed there. We have had tremendous success and a proven track record in Jefferson County. We want to take that solution to scale. Mm -hmm. Well, we have with us uh, a couple who understands this issue very well, and we're so glad that David and Kayla Green have joined us. They've been on a couple of other KET programs before and shared your courageous story of losing your beloved son, Dominique, in 2015 to an overdose. So we thank you for once again sharing your story and hopefully inspiring others to uh, also do the same and to get involved in this, uh, this fight. Tell us what message you'd want to communicate the most to people who are watching tonight. Well, Dominique was vocal about his addiction, and so we have the drive to keep his message alive, and his main message was don't try it for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I have his journal here that we found after he passed, and that's what he said. He said after he tried it the first time, uh, from the urging of, his, of a friend, that he was totally addicted, and he called it a devil's drug. He said because, it, you know, he, you know, he had five overdoses, six when he died. He said, and it just feels like you're going to sleep. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't, you don't, you know, it's calming. It's, you know, it's relaxing. And um, after, well, three or four um, uh, recovery facilities, he, he still wasn't able to, to fight the addiction. So we've uh, taken it upon ourselves. We started a foundation. We just want to get the word out there that if you try it one time, it's going to kill you. Right. And it's you would never you. thought that Dominique would have been involved and even dabbled mm -hmm. the one time. No. Isn't that right, Mrs. Uh -huh. Green? Absolutely. Um, Dominique is, was our youngest child. And, uh, you know, we lived in a, in a neighborhood that, you know, people think of as not, you know, a bad side of a town and mm -hmm. things like that. But it doesn't matter, you know, where you live or where you're from or how much money you have or what color you are. I mean, this is a drug that doesn't discriminate. And so, uh, I mean, it's far reaching, uh, you know, we, he's from a parents that's been married 32 years and he's the young, you know, he was a good kid. Uh, he, you know, he made a, a bad choice, you know, to take it. And uh, then he just couldn't, he couldn't break the addiction. So the uh, fatal overdose was laced with fentanyl and that's, you know, what, what killed him. And uh, he's just, uh, he, he would want us to do this. So we take our pain, and it's pain right. every day. Right. But if we can get the word out, so we um, speak at schools, we speak at uh, high school here in Fayette County, we speak at uh, middle schools in Georgetown, uh, Kentucky. Uh, we you know, spoke at the Manchester prison and things like that. So just whatever we can do, to, you know, we, the, the main thing too is that we do not want Dominique to be just a statistic. Um, community action here in Lexington got, got involved and uh, they actually produced a documentary on Dominique's story. It's about 40 minutes long. Uh, Cameron Mentor is the uh, producer of that documentary. I think he's here in mm -hmm. the audience. And uh, it just, they're gonna use it in the, in the community to, to try to reach, you know, youth that are at risk mm -hmm. and even adults, you know, yeah, like us and things like that, too. just trying to help parents to know what to look for and, uh, you know, just try to Peer combat pressure. it, that you, yeah. you know. So, Peer Mr. Pressure. Green, so one message, if you could send to parents tonight, what would it be? Watch your children. If they're a, Dominique uh, was persuaded by a friend. In the middle school students we've talked to, we told them, it's your friends. If they try to get you on, run, tell somebody. Uh, because at that age, you want to be popular, you want friends, and watch your children. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I say, yes, your child too, because we were naive, we were like, not, not in my house. Not in my house. There's no way drugs get in my house, and they got in my house. Well, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Green, for yeah. sharing your story you and having, having the courage to do that. Thank you for having us. And uh, thank you so very much thank you. for thank being you. here with us. We really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Um, we do know, Dr. Breswell, that the, one of the steps in helping to reduce overdose deaths is by making this little device more available. And this is Narcan, which is the brand name of naloxone, which is an overdose reversal drug. So tell us about how this works and how available it is and how people can get it. So the amazing thing is, as someone who's intoxicated or overdosed, that little device can instantly reverse the effects 
of that opiate overdose and restore breathing and function so they can be transported to a hospital and evaluated. And the, the key is, is that this needs to be readily available in our community. And one of the successes is, is that we do now have a significant supply in the hands of our first responders, but also our community, our treatment centers, our correctional center, settings. And, and our Surgeon General was here from Washington in Northern Kentucky and said this is as, as important as learning CPR and having a defibrillator. And so we, we see our communities rising up, hosting events, distributing it. Our pharmacists have been key partners in dispensing it. And so the, the good news is, is that Narcan is becoming more readily available. And it's easy to use, a nasal spray? It's very simple. There's not a significant danger. If the person's not having an overdose, mm -hmm. it has no ill effects. And so we, it's important that people carry it, have it available. If you're operating a clinic, a center, a school, it really needs to be available. This is how we're gonna save folks' lives because the first step to entering recovery is remaining alive. And so we, we must make it more available. And mobile pharmacies have this in stock, right? So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So our Department of Public Health is uh, one of our key players in the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. And they have developed a, an outreach program where they're out in communities with a, a mobile trailer that serves as a, 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 an opportunity to educate the community mm -hmm. and provide this, but also provide linkages to treatment. And so uh, it's a really, ex uh, it, it's an example of how the cabinet is working across departments, behavioral health, public health, child welfare, uh, as well as our Department of Medicaid Services, our health systems, but, uh, but, but really having these mobile vans is a way to get communities aware and then distribute it uh, locally. Yeah, and we have a little bit more information about that in a video clip about the mobile pharmacy that Dr. Brenzel just spoke of. Let's take a look. It's a sign of our times, a mobile pharmacy that travels the state providing free doses of the opioid overdose reversal drug naloxone, also known as Narcan. The van is a partnership between the Kentucky Pharmacists Association and the Kentucky Department for Public Health. You know, the opioid crisis is not going anywhere anytime soon in the state of Kentucky, in this country. And we can all make a difference by being trained and prepared and ready to save a life. The great thing about naloxone is anybody can be a hero with it. It really is that easy. I mean, a kid can learn how to use it. And today, we're just going to be doing the um, education. On this day, the van was invited by the Jessamine County Health Department, who advertised the event to their entire community. Before receiving their naloxone, attendees receive a 10-minute training on how to administer the drug to someone who is overdosed. I decided to come out today because in the past uh, I had issues with addiction and uh, overdoses have been prevalent in places that I've hung out. So we used to use some pretty primitive methods to, to try and shock people back to life. It's like a plague out here. You, you can't go anywhere without seeing drugs or people overdosing and, and I thought coming here would be a good opportunity to be able to maybe save somebody's life or change somebody's life along the way. If purchased privately, Narcan can cost up to $140 for a kit that includes two doses. It's uh, not necessarily affordable, you know, for a lot of the folks, you know, that want to purchase the naloxone. You know, so making it available, you know, through this free distribution is very important. It gets it to the hands of the people that maybe are most at risk. Uh, you know, you never know when someone may just go down in, in Walmart or Kroger. It's nice to have the, the, the people that have the, the ability to, to step in and do something. The visit by the van is part of a community-wide opioid response effort, which also includes a needle exchange program. Ashley McCarty DeFore, a peer education specialist who works in the needle exchange program, also knows personally the value of this drug. I wanted to get trained in how to dispense Narcan because I'm, a, I'm around individuals who may need that one day, you know, working in the needle exchange program. And me, myself, you know, years ago when I was in active addiction, I tried to kill myself by overdosing and that wasn't around. So I know how important and how powerful that, that can be to have today. Like Ashley, many of the attendees are people who work at the health department. After last year's training, health department staff were actually faced with someone who had overdosed. It had been um, one of our syringe ex exchange participants who, who comes faithfully. And I think it's because of that trust that the participant had in us that he brought his friend back here after he had overdosed and come knocking on our door, letting us know that his friend had 
overdosed and we immediately responded and, and fortunate for us we had some doses on hand from some of the nurses who had went through the um, mobile pharmacy distribution a year before that and uh, they responded they administered the naloxone uh, actually revived the guy and uh, you, you know a lot of us saw it work firsthand you know <laughs> pretty amazing to those people who believe that distributing Narcan only encourages further use, people at the event had this to say. This, this touches you and you probably don't even realize it. Um, and we all can be part of the solution by just caring a little bit more and trying to touch people's lives and keep them not in isolation. You know, these people are sons, these people are daughters, these people are mothers, these people are fathers, you know? And, and if it was somebody in our family, we want to do everything that we can to help them. It took me going through treatment 13 times to finally get clean and stay clean. That's the only hope we have is just show them a little love and, and be persistent. We have a couple of people who were in that video with us tonight, Jody Jaggers and Ashley DeFore. If you'll just kind of wave at us, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause for their great work and efforts. Naloxone is a type of harm reduction, but so is syringe or needle exchange. And Dr. Brenzel, I want to ask you about needle exchange programs. Uh, how do they work and how prevalent are they across the state? So another one of the successes we have in Kentucky is, is that we had enabling legislation that allows communities who choose to develop harm reduction syringe exchange programs. And what they're primarily aimed at initially is decreasing the risk of, and spread of infectious diseases and, and preventing hepatitis and even more tragic an HIV epidemic. Mm -hmm. However, one of the most important things is this is not about syringes. This is not about uh, uh, a supply of needles. This is about the first step in the road to recovery. And so ensuring that we co-locate harm reduction, Narcan, uh, with syringe exchange, but also have treatment resources and available. And what we're seeing is people are using this. If, if they decide to take a positive step around their health and come to a syringe exchange, that's the first step to, to entering recovery. And about 43 of these are across the state? I think it's even higher than that. Maybe and, higher and, than and, that? And, the, and, the, and it, every day we get more communities asking for help and information. We're looking to fund their Narcan distribution. We're looking to fund co-locating treatment. And so uh, it, it is really exciting to see our communities accept this and embrace this opportunity for folks to get into treatment. Well, we have Dr. Artis Hoven with us, an infectious disease specialist with the Kentucky Department for Public Health. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is your area, and you know very well HIV and hepatitis C, so tell us about hepatitis C as it relates to opioid use and HIV drug use. Well, thank you, Renee. Yes, we have been actually dealing with this challenge for several years, actually more than that. But over the last two to three years at the Kentucky Department for Public Health, we've had a concerted effort to try and evaluate where we stand with hepatitis C. We know it is a problem. We are now fourth in the nation with acute hepatitis C cases. And if you look at the risk factor, the predominant one is injecting drug use. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we have been able to analyze these, this data as it is slowly coming in, it is a big challenge. And we in the Department for Public Health have had to work very hard to outreach to our communities, to our local health departments, and to the public at large to make them understand the importance of being tested for hepatitis C. What is the treatment for the disease and how accessible is that treatment? Well, treatment is wonderful now. We've gone from where difficulties were encountered significantly with the treatments that were available. Now there are oral therapies. They are shorter in duration. They are extremely well tolerated. They st still remain expensive. Mm -hmm. However, in our collaborative work with the Department for Medicaid, we have been able to now look at ways of diminishing the cost, increasing the access to care for those individuals with active hepatitis C. And what about HIV? Those numbers rising? The numbers in Kentucky have been fairly flat over the last several years. On average, we'll have 350 to 360 new cases of HIV per year. But what we did see this past uh, fall mm -hmm. in northern Kentucky was a cluster of HIV cases developing, and it all was centered around injecting drug use. Mm -hmm. So needle exchange programs, in your view, would work to help those issues. Absolutely. They are without a doubt 
a very important part of the entire harm reduction platform that we have to deal with. Not only is, is it's not all about needles and mm -hmm. exchanges. It's about education. It's about linking folks to treatment for HIV, hepatitis C, substance use disorder, you name it. But harm reduction platforms are very important. And so that information is given at that point of contact when they visit those needle exchange sites. Exactly. And the other thing that develops is great trust in those programs. So people repeatedly go to visit, they get instruction and education. As that trust develops, they are more willing to open themselves up to referral for care so that they are willing to accept treatment for their substance use disorder. Yeah, thank you Dr. Hoven. Jennifer Hancock, I want to come back to you as a treatment provider. Tell us about what you're seeing. You're addressing Hep C sure. and, and your facilities and the services that you provide. Volunteers of America, in partnership with our local health department, opened Kentucky's first syringe exchange program in Jefferson County in June of 2015. Three years later, we've treated more than 15,000 individuals. 40% uh, of them are repeat customers. They're coming back because they trust our harm reduction specialist. I had an amazing opportunity just a few weeks ago to do a ride along mm -hmm. on our RV. It's a mobile syringe exchange program. So we go to those parts of our community that need us the most. I had an opportunity to see our harm reduction specialists in action. Not only are they providing a lifeline to treatment, to infectious disease testing, prevention, education, they're also triaging what could be some serious medical complications by talking about abscess and wounds that are on individuals' bodies because of their injection sites that are getting worn over time and routing them into um, care before it becomes an emergency. They are absolutely saving people's lives. The level of respect that they have for the individuals we serve is something that I am absolutely inspired by. Yeah. So for those who say that this uh, tactic, needle exchange programs or syringe exchange programs are an enabling method, you would say what? It is enabling people to take that first very courageous step towards a path of recovery. It is the first step. Yeah. Dr. Brenzel, in addition to the Hep C, what are the other physical ailments that could come from long-term drug use or IV use? So, I mean, one of the other factors around this opiate crisis is, is increased overall health care costs due to the complications because IV drug use is associated, as you mentioned, not just with infection, but also things like uh, endocarditis, which is an infection of the heart mm -hmm. valves. That's a, a very expensive procedure, often requiring open heart surgery to care for. Sometimes infection spreads from there. We're seeing brain abscesses related to spread of bacteria through IV injection. We're seeing cellulitis abscesses. Uh, and, and so it's really uh, behooves us to prevent those things because of the economic burden that that's uh, putting upon our healthcare system, and not to mention the individuals who are having to go through these uh, in medical experiences. Yeah. So let's pivot now from the medical experiences and talk about law enforcement, Russell and Van, to bring you in. We know that all drug epidemics have a supply side, and that's our demand side, and that's where you all fit in. Uh, tell us about what law enforcement is doing, Russell Coleman, in, in this area of opioid addiction. Well, this, this crisis is a, is a Gordian knot. It's particularly important that we deal with, with treatment, particularly important that we deal with prevention, but a critically important component is enforcement. L let me answer that first by saying what enforcement is not. Enforcement is not about arresting addicts. It's not about prosecuting those that are, are challenged by this, this epidemic. It's about going after the traffickers. It's about going after the drug trafficking organizations that whether it's opiates or meth, as we discussed earlier, being brought in by drug trafficking organizations from across, mostly from across the southwest border. It's about aggressively taking down those and incarcerating those that are bringing this poison into our communities. And as you said, meth is not just home laboratories anymore. It's coming in from these Mexican cartels, which maybe we don't have that full image of that. No, we, we do such a much improved uh, advocates like uh, Ms. Hale from Operation Unite, mm -hmm. who's, who's with us today, uh, advocates, many of the folks like the Greens that, that share their extraordinary experience are, are doing an amazing job of talking about opiates. Uh, but what it's, it's critically important that we remember that this is a multi-front war. The other war remains methamphetamines. As much as the district that I serve uh, Oldham County down to the river counties in the west. We have one county, Jefferson, that uh, has an opiate challenge. Every other county in that district, the primary drug threat is for methamphetamines. And by the way, with Jefferson County, the number one drug we're seeing in Jefferson County is meth. 
but it's the opiates that are doing the acute killing. Right. So if you will, track the move of a drug from the cartel to here and the interdiction points along the way. Well, these are, these are business organizations that are trafficking these, these drugs. They operate flexibly, uh, very ruthlessly like business organizations. They use some of the same techniques to ship that we do. Mm -hmm. We go online, we order things through UPS, through FedEx, through the United States Mail. We're a society that's now built on convenience. All, much of the opiates, much of the meth, much of the drugs we're seeing being shipped by parcel, by truck, by this wonderful transportation infrastructure that is fueling our economy, well, the organizations that are distributing this poison are using the same techniques. But on, this, on the same note, law enforcement is responding in kind and responding aggressively. So what are we doing to keep the cartels at bay? Well, for one thing, we're, we're getting smarter and using every technique, every tool in our toolkit to, uh, to bring down those that are, that are leading these organizations, from how they handle their money, to how they ship these items, to the technology they utilize. We also have access to that technology and we're utilizing, again, aggressively. Uh, another component of the supply side, Dr. Chang, is those that are legally prescribed by doctors. And Dr. Philip Chang, who's the medical director for UK Healthcare, is with us. And you've instituted some very unique protocols to address uh, prescription opioids and to cut down on the number of powerful painkillers that patients are getting when they come to the ER. Absolutely. Thank you, Renee. I think one of the key things here is to rethink the way we manage pain. Uh, pain management can start with non-opioids and then if it's needed, we can add opioids. Uh, for too long, we've started with the most powerful and stay with the most powerful. Uh, and that's created a, a lot of these issues. I think this starts with prevention. Uh, if we don't close the funnel, uh, we will continue to have too many of our Kentuckians who continue to need help, continue to need naloxone. Um, we hear stories about patients coming in for a minor procedure and end up leaving the hospital, leaving the clinic, leaving the procedure suite with multiple, multiple 30 Percocets and so on and so forth. So we've also instituted a program where many of our surgeries are opioid free surgeries. And that has, we're seeing some results. And so how are you managing that pain effectively if it's not the use of opioids? Well, you know, good old fashioned over the counter, acetaminophen, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, typically does the trick. And so what are the patient's responses to that new protocol? You know, it's about setting expectations. If the patients know that they're coming here and their pain will be well taken care of with these drugs uh, over the counter and, and that we're there for them, they're, they're fine with it. And other hospitals, are they taking a cue from UK Healthcare? You know, we are, we're working, with, we're partnering with St. Clair Medical Center, St. E, uh, Western Kentucky, we're all talking about it. We're learning from these institutions. They're learning from us. It's a wonderful exchange of uh, ideas. And what are they most concerned about in it, taking on that new protocol? You, you know, um, we're all concerned about the same things. What about, what if somebody calls at 2 in the morning? We haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. We have not seen that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Philip Chang. We appreciate the work you're doing, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Uh, now let's keep talking about the demand side and how the state and communities are responding. Jennifer Hancock, I want to turn to you from your perspective as a social worker and someone who interacts with people in recovery all the time. Uh, what are the other dynamics at play here that we should be talking about? Well, we immediately assess for levels of family support and look at a family-focused treatment approach. We know that we cannot isolate the individual out of his or her um, unique support system. So at Volunteers of America, we're really focused on targeting the entire family system. We look as a part of this integrated treatment plan at their child welfare go goals. We work with a lot of women who are pregnant and parenting, many of whom have lost care of their kids um, because of their addiction. So we're working to restore their families. That's a key part of a treatment goal. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we always think from the moment we enter someone into residential treatment, where will they live? There is a lack of safe, affordable, sober housing. So that's something that we're looking at in the communities in which we serve. And in addition to that, the workforce reentry. And we're so proud to have partners in this work from ARC in Southeastern Kentucky, Kentucky Anna Works in Jefferson County, and all across the state who are really looking to target um, the workforce reentry part of this problem and do that um, collaboratively with treatment providers like Volunteers of America. Benninger, before we move on to our next segment, to talk about the flow of prescription medication, the CASPER program, the electronic monitoring program uh, that Kentucky was the first to adopt in the nation. Tell us how successful that is in helping this issue. 
In uh, 2011, we dispensed 371 million dosage units of pain pills in this state. The next year, we required, pharma, required physicians, nurse practitioners, and dentists to use that CASPER system before prescribing an opioid. In 2017, that number was down to 278 million. Mm -hmm. So we've nearly dropped 100 million dosage units of, uh, of dangerous painkillers being released into our medicine cabinets and left to lay there. Mm -hmm. That will have an impact. It's having an impact and it will continue to. And as we go on in the future, as years go on, we're going to create a lot fewer folks with an opioid use disorder by accident. With so many opioids that we were prescribing just a short five or six years ago, people who never would have had methamphetamine in their home, people who never would have had cocaine or an illicit drug in their home, guess what? They had opioids in their home. And then a friend, a neighbor, uh, a child, uh, anyone can access those and start down that path yeah. of addiction. Yeah. We know that people who overdose once are more likely to ultimately die of an overdose. That's why getting them into treatment is so very important. And we're going to learn about an exciting new program in Alexandria that helps people get into treatment at the point of an overdose. So let's watch. Though the Alexandria Police Department is relatively small, Chief Mike Ward has some big ideas about the role of police and how to serve the public best. And these ideas are making an impact on the community as a whole and the opioid epidemic. 67% of our agency's calls for service are non-criminal in nature. People don't know what to do, they dial 911. Local police will answer anything from a spider crawling across the counter to a snake in the garage um, to a, a homicide. Recognizing that police are not social workers, though they're often called to be, Chief Ward decided to hire an actual licensed social worker, Kelly Pompilio, to work alongside the officers in the department. One thing I've learned through this whole process, and Kelly is responsible for teaching me this, people in crisis cannot self-advocate because they're emotionally involved and in crisis. And that's where the police social worker comes in and helps guide people to the right services. With Kelly in position, the chief could implement another big idea, the Alexandria Angels Program, a community outreach initiative which helps people with substance use problems get into treatment and on the road to long-term recovery. They follow up with every person who has overdosed in the area. Initially, when we make contact, they're, they're shocked. They're scared. Um, once we're able to sit down and really talk about it, I would say about 90% of people want the help. I have an Kelly spends a lot of time on the phone, navigating the complexities of the substance abuse treatment system. I know I've been on the phone with treatment providers and told there's a waiting list or call back in an hour or call back the next day. And realistically, you're lucky if they're going to be alive the next day. So to have them call and get told that repeatedly that there's no beds available um, is very hard for any individual. So this weekend was a little crazy. The program relies on the help of volunteer angels who are people with a personal connection to the issue, like Christina Huynell, who lost her son to the disease of addiction. I was so ashamed. Oh, you're the mother of a heroin addict. Where, where were you? Where was I? I was at his football games. I was at his Boy Scout meetings. I was at that fishing hole when we had our date time. Nowhere in a book of parenting is there, okay, here's what happens if they do use drugs and here's where to go. I know there's other families who need hope and help in direction. The Angels program not only helps people get into treatment, it supports them as they get out of treatment. They're helping Nicholas Myros find a sober living house. I get overwhelmed very easily, especially fresh out of active addiction. Um, when a lot comes onto my plate, I get overwhelmed and they're helping take all that off of me. So it's just one less thing that I got to worry about and I can focus on living and doing the right thing. Because when I get stressed out, one thing pops into my head and that's how to relieve stress. They need somebody that can support them and show that they care, that, that they're not just that they're struggling alone with themselves. This has changed my viewpoint on the police department by saying that they are here to help because before I always thought they just wanted to get me in trouble. 
To date, the program has reached out to over 90 people and over 40 have entered treatment. Kelly is so busy the department is hiring a second social worker. For the first time in my career, I'm seeing this agency help people work through problems that we have never been able to help with. To other police departments, Chief Ward has one message. Hire a darn social worker and let them do the job. Uh, they're phenomenal. And those words of Chief Mike Ward. We appreciate you so much, Chief. And also, can Kelly Pompilio is in the audience, if you'll wave to us. They're back on over there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your incredible work. Thank you and for sharing your story with us. Van, uh, you were the one who clued us in on this program. Why do you think it's a model that works and should be highlighted? Chief Ward is really a, a thought leader in law enforcement on a lot of different ways, but uh, this was one of his best ideas he's come up with. Yeah. Um, a lot of police are, are reluctant to step into that social worker role because, frankly, that's not what we're trained to do. But to have one there at the police department to make those referrals that can help with those situations is just genius in my mind. Yeah. There's a couple other resources you also want to promote tonight. Some websites they are, so tell us about this. Well, we, we were lucky working with the Kentucky Injury Prevention Research Center on a grant from, uh, from CDC to build a website called findhelpnowky.org. The neat thing about this, we've got over 500 treatment providers on there. They're going on there daily and updating their status of whether or not they can see patients that day. So you don't have to call 31 different residential providers to try to find a bed. You can go to this website, The Travelocity of Treatment, mm -hmm. and uh, find a bed pretty quickly. And, and as well as medication assisted treatment services and, and outpatient services, not just residential mm -hmm. programs. The other thing that we were able to do with some money in the Justice Cabinet is partner with Operation Unite. Unite had been running on a call center for many, many years, but we really wanted to take that statewide. It was just in the 5th Congressional District. So we partnered with them. We've got a minimum bachelor level social worker on the other end of the phone that can really help people walk through this maze of bureaucracy that is substance abuse treatment because it's so many different forms. Some things are right for one patient, not for another. Uh, and and these, these folks that work on the other end of that phone can really, really help guide people and help people make good decisions. So don'tletthemdie.org and findhelpnowky.org, right? Yeah, let me give that phone number out. It is 8338-KY-HELP, okay. 8338-859-4357. All right, thank you for that. Uh, to talk about a model that gets people into treatment at the point of overdose of Scott Heselton, we're glad to have you back. We've had you on our programs before. You're VP of Addiction Services at Centerstone and a peer support specialist, Mr. Keith Farah. So thank you both for being here. Uh, I want to start with you, Scott. Tell us about the partnership you have with the U of L Emergency Department. Thank you, Renee. Uh, I'm encouraged to discuss uh, promising best practices uh, in partnership with the U of L Hospital and support from the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities. We've been able to introduce peer support in the emergency room at the site of overdose reversal. Uh, we've seen remarkable results. Uh, we've seen over 350 people that we've engaged and over a third of them had said, yes, I want help. And we've been able to walk them right across the street and enter into uh, recovery services. Uh, we offer medically directed withdrawal management. Mm -hmm. And quite often we can stabilize our clients using life-saving medications and allow them to enter the process of recovery. Yeah, so Keith talked about the importance of a of being having a peer support specialist right there at that initial point of contact. It's one of the aspects of my job I love the most. And I say job loosely because it, it really doesn't feel like a job. It feels like I get to bring my lived experience into a situation of crisis with a person and to see the understanding in their eyes when I'm standing at their bed talking to them about knowing what it feels like to wake up in the emergency room and have no idea why you were there and not know where help is going to come from. Um, it, it's, it's an amazing privilege that I get to do. and. To provide that option for people um, is amazing itself also and literally walk them to treatment from the hospital and like Scott said the rates we have it, it baffles me I don't know that I would have been willing to wake up to a stranger in a hospital and actually follow them to treatment right but these folks are just so willing and so grateful that we show up and provide help um, that our success rates have been amazing. What's the conversation like? What is it you're telling them? You know, typically yeah. I will introduce myself. I'm a fairly large guy, so I will let them know <laughs> at first that I'm not a parole officer or the police. Okay. There's no active warrants. Um, <laughs> and then I'll ask them what got them there, and I can immediately find some type of commonality. I've been sober myself for five years, mm -hmm. and I was multi-addicted. So there's not much they can be going through that I haven't experienced myself. 
and I'll just start to self-disclose with him. Mm -hmm. And it, it tends to put them at ease. And when that's the, that's the difference in one addict talking to another addict. There's things I've experienced that they've experienced that only they and I know about. Yeah, relatability is Absolutely. so key. Absolutely. Yeah, Scott, one thing that's so unique and critical with your program is that the treatment options that are available and the individualized treatment that you really focus on. So tell us a little bit about that approach. Yeah, and, and another program that uh, works in tandem with this is what we call a bridge clinic. Uh, it's in close proximity to the emergency department. We have brought in a medical director, Dr. Jonathan Kunis, uh, ASAM uh, certified medical professional and increased access to life-saving medications. Once someone stabilizes from the biological symptoms of addiction, they're much more able to engage and participate in services. We have a full complement of services, everything from medically directed withdrawal management, often using life-saving medications, to outpatient services, intensive outpatient services. We've stood up 22 recovery residences in the last 12 months, and that's with wraparound support, case managers, peers, and a team of employment specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, quite remarkable once someone engages the transformation that can occur. So so there is hope. Treatment works. Recovery is possible. And for women, too, and pregnant women, you have a facility there as well. In Shelbyville, That's a 10-bed right. facility for pregnant women and up to one school-aged child. Uh, we provide attachment-informed uh, approaches, really treating the mother-child dyad uh, and the uh, effects of recovery on that relationship. Again, full continuum of care and remarkable results. Yeah, well, thank you for your remarkable work, both of you. And we appreciate you sharing that tonight. Dr. Brenz, I want to go to you. It seems the ultimate goal for patients is to have that individual treatment you know if you need long-term uh, rehabilitation that there's a way for you to get that if you need medication assisted treatment that there's a way for you to get that are we at the point where we have on-demand type of services that are throughout the state are we there yet well thanks Renee I do think that one of the things we're most proud of in the cabinet and with our partners is that we have dramatically increased access and our goal as you stated is treatment on demand if a person is ready we need to be able to look them in the eye we need to be able to walk them into treatment it still troubles me that so few people with an active opiate use disorder in treatment, we might estimate around 20%. And I do just want to echo that I do think the emergency department of our hospitals is a key entry point into treatment because individuals who overdose right now we're not being extremely successful in getting them to enter treatment. So uh, uh, programs like Centerstone is very critical. Our hospitals, St. Elizabeth in Northern Kentucky, as well as our partners at UK are all working to change the culture in the emergency room, mm -hmm. that this is the front door. And one of the things that I've learned is people in opiate addiction, they fear withdrawal more than they fear death. And if we can look them in the eye and say, we can treat your withdrawal, you do not have to go out and get a fix. That next fix might be the one that kills them. And so we need to be able to offer them the full array of options, including the administration of buprenorphine in the emergency room. And that's one of our stated goals. And I'm really excited that our physicians and our emergency departments are embracing that entry point into treatment. Can you talk really briefly about the role that primary care physicians play in prescribing medication-assisted treatment or MAT? When we get people started in the emergency room, one of the keys is that we have some place to refer them. Mm -hmm. And so building a, the community capacity for appropriately prescribed medications in conjunction with the psychosocial supports. But primary care doctors, many of them go ahead and get trained in being able to administer medication. But what they're looking for is those partners with the, the other providers uh, so that they can uh, provide. But, but I do see a day where a provider treats opiate use disorder in one room, hypertension in the next room, and a stubbed toe in the next room. And then we remove the stigma of having to go to a special place. And our primary care docs, I think, are ready for that. And the ones who do it are incredibly grateful that they have the opportunity because they see people get better. And they say, I treat a lot of chronic conditions that don't get better, but people in recovery get better and they're grateful. Yeah. Good point to make. Uh, Jennifer, I want to come to you and ask you about what treatment looks like for the people that you serve with the Volunteers of America. It's comprehensive. It is individualized and really customized to their unique circumstances. We serve everyone from individuals exiting incarceration and work with them on a path of re-entering their communities, their families, into the workforce through a very rigorous evidence-based program. We work with veterans who have proudly served our country and who come home with a variety of ailments, some that are psychological and rooted in the substance use disorder. And then we absolutely target women who are pregnant and parenting. We know that for every pregnant woman we serve, we have the opportunity to save two lives. And we're really proud of the fact that we have integrated this family-focused model by allowing women to bring 
all of their kids into treatment mm -hmm. so that we're really essentially providing this primary prevention intervention for their kids, talking to them in an age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate way about the disease of addiction and what the consequences to them have been because of their parents' um, illness. Mm -hmm. And that has been very successful in helping families cope with um, the consequences of this crisis. Right. You spoke earlier, Jennifer, about transition into housing and uh, some of those other issues. And we know that the majority leader of the U.S. Senate, our senior Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell, has recently introduced a bill that's called the Career Act. I know you're very familiar with that, which is focused on services that support people as they transition into independent living or to the workforce. So if you can speak to what kind of impact it would make for Kentucky if this bill were to become law. It would be phenomenal. Leader McConnell has been right there with us every step of the way. He understands deeply this crisis that we are facing. He knows that without adequate housing and workforce solutions, long-term recovery is very challenging, even under the best of circumstances with the best family supports in place. So we have to concentrate on these other aspects of treatment and we can't dissect treatment from these important elements. So Leader McConnell understands that in the most comprehensive global way possible. We are eager to have more integrated solutions like that available for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Russell, I'll give you a chance to chime in on that Career Act. I wouldn't have any comment on, on pending federal legislation. I'm in a new role, wear, sure. wear a different hat. What I, I would like to, to comment on briefly, though, is while physicians are part of our solution in the, uh, in, in the Commonwealth, we have a lot of discussion in law enforcement on how much of what we do is a deterrent. We also know that some physicians, some, a small percentage who've abandoned their oath, are part of the problem have been passed throughs to, for many of these opiates. And we, both myself, I sit in Lexington, I'm in the Eastern District of Kentucky, my colleague Rob Duncan uh, is, is sitting in the audience here, are aggressively prosecuting those physicians that have abandoned that oath and have essentially become drug dealers. And if there's a deterrable group of actors out there, it's those doctors. Mm -hmm. Van, you care to comment on the deterrable group being the doctors? Well, it's that's absolutely crucial that uh, when, when, when someone has given up their oath and they've just become uh, a script pad for anybody who walks in the door that those people are addressed but that is a small percentage for the others there are a lot of naive prescribers as well and we've seen that over the last four or five years we've as we've done a lot of prescriber education uh, all over this state uh, prescribing patterns are changing and changing dramatically and that's that's going to have a big impact as well yeah. As we close here tonight, we'd like to focus on the next generation of problem solvers and disruptors. Discarded needles and syringes in our streets and playgrounds are a big problem in many communities and endanger those who try to dispose of them. After a suggestion from a local police officer, a group of Ashland middle schoolers took the problem into their own hands by inventing a safe syringe disposal system. Their invention won them the 2017 Samsung Solve for Tomorrow Award and has put them in the national spotlight. Let's take a look. Unfortunately, the noodle problem is going to be around for years and years and years to come. I was at these meetings and they were talking about picking up these needles but with a uh, uh, tweezers and, and, and pliers and we're, I'm just like that's not a good idea especially with the with some of this dust that could be on the needles so I come up here and talk to them at the school at Ashland Middle School and I said make me something something that can go over top of the needle so we don't have first responders don't have to come in contact with the needle all it was like a two days later they come and said hey we got a prototype do you want to look at it and it just snowballed after that. So we had known that you know innovation was so, trying to find something new to solve a difficult problem. So um, we knew that and then being able to start the project it allowed us just to show how important innovation is and how um, it can be used not only in school but in our um, in our world in our real life world. <laughs> From like taking quizzes and stuff it seems like you're applying like everything you know and you're just like going out into the real world kind of and just like finding a problem to fix like an engineer or somebody else would. The prototype is 12 centimeters by 4 centimeters and um, with, with our box it has flexible teeth so the flexible teeth are able to wrap around the needle itself so basically your needle would be on the ground your flexible teeth um, spring up and, and wrap around the needle, needle the needle pops up and it's safely enclosed. I was in awe to what, what they had accomplished. This is something that could be nationwide and be used in every ambulance and every police department in in the, in the nation. We are the Samsung team but it's also I think a community project too because 
every every police department, every fire department, every EMT has sort of um, pitched in a little bit to help out. Um, even though we our team may have wanted it, won it our community has really won it. I always thought about like problems that were out there, but this project has, real, uh, has really uh, showed us that middle schoolers can really have an impact on their community and help uh, their community out. We've received emails and different things from places um, all over the country asking about our project, asking about how they can get involved. Um, you know, it just shows that one small idea can, I mean, it can change our, our nation and maybe even our world. This doesn't solve the drug crisis. It just helps us stay safe while we are trying to solve the drug crisis. <laughs> Talk about some smart opioid disruptors right there. Ashland Middle School, give them a round of applause. And also, I think the principal is in the audience today. The principal is with us. Thank you, sir, uh, for helping these, inspiring these students to do this great work and to help their community be safer. A wonderful way to kind of end the program on an up note. And we will, as we kind of leave tonight, give you just a couple of seconds, each of you, to give some final thoughts and takeaways that you'd want the viewers to to, to have with them tonight. Russell, we'll start with you. We, we've talked about a lot of numbers, a lot of statistics. Mm -hmm. Let me just say the most, one of the most important numbers is one. We lose one person a day in Jefferson County of drug-related death. Uh, we lose a Kentuckian one at a time and these families being impacted. The message I leave is that we must have more engagement by partners, by individuals, by companies, by nonprofits that have never played in this space because whether it's a workforce development impact whether it's an economic development impact, whether it's just the right thing to do because it's touching so many of our communities. We need more involvement by folks who never would have thought that this would touch upon their business model or their community or their neighborhood. So you see the scope of the problem we've laid it out. We're losing Kentuckians one at a time and we need the business community and we need these other folks engaging with us. Jennifer. Russell's exactly right. You know, there's no other disease like this that is as stigmatized as addiction. And it's really all of our responsibility to bring this out of the darkness into the light, um, to give people hope that you can recover. Sometimes the headlines are so grim, family members give up hope. And it's up to all of us to make sure that we keep hope alive and bring people together to Russell's good point to be a part of an effective solution. There is recovery that works and we have solutions. We need more people to join us. Good point. Dr. Brenzel. And I just like to add, it is about one, but also that 1,565 people in 2017 aren't going to have another birthday, aren't going to witness the birth of their child, the graduation of their child. And it that report is sobering and it, I think, reinforces that we all need to redouble our efforts. But I am optimistic. I feel it. I feel it when we give community presentations. I feel it when we talk to our medical colleagues, our law enforcement colleagues. I think Kentucky is turning the corner. It's been a long, a long slog, but I, I have to be optimistic that, that we, and KET has helped us increase the awareness and we appreciate that. Well, thank you. Van, last word. At the beginning of the program, you said 70% of people in Kentucky believe addiction is a disease. If you'd have took that poll a half a dozen years ago, it would have been a far much different result. Mm -hmm. We are turning a corner, and people are beginning to recognize this is a disease and a disease we can treat. Like Mr. Farrell said, he, he, he's in recovery for five years and helping other, lead other people there. I get to be here, meet people like that every, all, every week, and it, it keeps me going yeah. and makes me optimistic. We can beat this. We will beat this. There's no quick fix. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a complicated issue, but we are moving in the right direction. Yeah. Fine words to end the program on. Thank you all very much. Thank you as well, and thank our audience, too. We've talked about treatment, harm reduction, and law enforcement tonight, and another equally important topic is prevention. We know that a lot of prevention starts with addressing mental health issues in our children, and so we are excited to announce that KET is launching a new ongoing initiative on mental health, beginning with a six-part series on youth mental health called you are not alone. Stay tuned in November for that series. And remember that if you are interested in finding treatment, please try the state's treatment locator. Find help now, ky.org. From all of us here at KET, thanks so very much for watching and take good care.